Welcome to our online service. We are glad that you have joined us and pray that God will meet you where you are at. We encourage you to join us in person for our weekly prayer meetings, Bible studies, and Sunday services. If you would like to give your life to Christ, pray with someone, or discuss a need, we would really love to hear from you. Let's pray together. <coughs> Father, we thank you so much for every blessing that you've poured out on us. Lord, we know we don't deserve your love. We know we don't deserve your forgiveness. And yet still you choose to love us. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would give us hearts that are right with you. We pray, Lord, that by our faith in you, you would continue to remind us of where we stand with you. And so, Father, for every soul in this place that has accepted you as Lord and Savior, that has repented of their sins, I pray, God, that you would help them to continue walking with you, to continue being with you. And I pray, Father, that as we learn to know you more and more, that your word would grow inside of us. Father, to bear fruit for your name and for your kingdom's sake. We pray, Lord, that as we start this new book, this new journey together, we pray, Father, that you would be with us, that you would strengthen us, that you would teach us through your Holy Spirit. Father, that through your word, you would help us to, to understand great and important truths for our faith, for our salvation. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to bless us with your word, continue to bless us with your spirit without measure. And Lord, won't you help us to increase in wisdom unto salvation. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Today we begin the great, important, powerful book of Romans. I've been thinking about this book for a long time, praying about whether we should be brave enough to journey there together, uh, because it is a difficult book to understand for a lot of people. As the Apostle Peter even himself said in his letter, sometimes Paul's writings are difficult to understand, but I trust by the grace of the Lord we'll be able to get through it and learn together. So today I'd like us to begin that journey with just a very brief introduction that Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. Now my excitement about this book is felt by a lot of preachers, a lot of teachers, a lot of great theologians in the past, and I'd just like to quote uh, two phrases for you. One from Martin Luther, who sort of launched the Reformation, and he said, Romans is the chief part of the New Testament, the perfect gospel, the absolute epitome of the gospel, the essence of the gospel. John Piper said, Romans is the most important theological Christian work ever written. The most important theological work ever written. The book of Romans has influenced many doctrines that we know, but especially those of grace, especially those of faith. And so we have the influence of people like St. Augustine, who was also influenced by Romans. John Calvin was also influenced by Romans. John Wesley was also influenced by Romans. Karl Barth and so, so many Others. And so I hope that you are excited as we join together in this journey, as we begin to discover what this book is about. And ultimately, it's about that. It's about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's about grace, and it's about faith, and it's about how God came to justify us before Him. And so if you have your Bibles, you can read with me from Romans chapter 1 and from verses 1 to 4. I'll be reading from the NIV. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, is, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Now you'll notice that in this introduction that we'll be dealing with today, Paul gives three basic um, introductory statements here. The first is who he is. So he introduces himself. Then he goes on to say what kind of gospel it is that he preaches. And then he goes on to say who this gospel is about. And that's Jesus Christ. And so those are the three sections we'll be looking at. But what we need to understand about Rome, when Paul wrote this letter, was that it was the capital city of the Roman Empire as a whole, not just um, of that place, but of the Roman Empire, and it was the ruling power of the world. So a lot of the influence in the rest of the world came from that place, and it was to them that Paul wrote. He'd never been there before, and so this, as, um, as John, sorry, Martin Luther said, was a perfect gospel. He was writing the essence of the gospel for these believers in Rome so they could understand in case he never went to them. So this was the gospel that Paul had been preaching for the last 20 years since he had been saved on that road to Damascus where he was going to persecute Christians. It was this gospel that he explains now through the entire book which he was preaching. And so Rome was filled with physical slaves, but more importantly, it was a place of spiritual slavery. So if you know Rome at all in that time, you'll know that they followed polytheism. They followed many different gods. Whatever god they found, they would worship. And so in that sense, it was a place of spiritual darkness. People were enslaved to sin. They were enslaved to a whole lot of spiritual things that were not life-giving. Spiritual things with which Paul had an issue with, of course, preaching this one gospel of Jesus Christ himself. And so Paul goes on to state who he is and what this gospel is. And so I'd like to start with a little bit of a story first. <coughs> in Ghana, in the 1600s, there was a castle. And in this castle, there were five dungeons underground. And in those dungeons, there were African slaves. They were taken from different parts of Africa, brought there so they could be shipped over to America and other places across the Atlantic Ocean. They were chained together, about 200 men at a time, for three months. And so they couldn't do much, there was not much light. It was a place of terror. It was a place of death. It was a place of darkness. But can you guess what was above this dungeon? A chapel. There was a chapel above this dungeon, where 200 men were sitting. Some of them were dead at that point. Um, some of them were screaming, some of them moaning in pain. All of them sitting in their own filth. Remember, they had been chained there for three months. They had to sit there with each other. No hope. Only fear. Only darkness. And above them was a people that was worshipping God. A people that were singing praises like we did this morning. People that were reading the scriptures like we are now. People that were maybe giving money for those less fortunate than themselves. But what makes this story so shocking is that the people in the chapel knew exactly what was happening in the dungeons underneath. They could sometimes hear the moans or the cries of those people in the dungeon. And they did nothing. They did nothing. They had become numb to the horrific trauma and the suffering that was happening just beneath their feet, under their very noses. And the difference between these people in this chapel and Paul is that Paul cared enough to preach the gospel. Paul cared enough to preach the gospel. He couldn't sit idly by while souls were being condemned to hell. He couldn't sit and block his ears to the cries of men and women without hope. Men and women without the gospel. He took it upon himself to do what God had called him to do. By the power of the Spirit inside of him, he went to proclaim the good news, to proclaim the gospel. And so Paul introduces himself and he says that he is a servant in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. And this is what we see in Paul's life, his whole life is based on this, serving the purpose for which Jesus Christ had saved him. He was a servant. 
He didn't think of himself as too important to go down into those dungeons. He didn't think of himself as too great a man to get his hands dirty for the sake of the gospel. No. He knew that there were people dying of spiritual darkness in Rome and that this influence was influencing the world. And so he took it upon himself to write this letter to give that all-important gospel to the church in Rome. He wanted to equip them with the grace of Christ, with the love of Christ, that they could share this gospel with the rest of the people around them so that they too could partner with him and partner with God in freeing those people in spiritual darkness, in spiritual terror, in spiritual death. And so he says that he is a servant of his master, Jesus Christ. And so he wrote this letter not to show off how much he knew about salvation, not to show off how great he was, but to serve the church, to equip the church with a full view of salvation. Second, he says that he's called to be an apostle. And so here we see why Paul went to these dark places, why he went to preach the gospel with such power, with such conviction, is because God called him, God set him apart for this very special mission to bring the gospel of God to those that are hurting, to those that are broken, to those that are sitting without hope, those that are helpless. And so this was the very specific mission that Paul was given. He was sent as an ambassador to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, wherever the Spirit of God would lead him. And so he says then, and confirms, he was set apart for this gospel. Paul was a golden instrument in the hand of God. He was set apart, sanctified for this exact purpose. And we too are called to be that. We too are called to share this gospel, to go into the dark places, to go where we know there is spiritual death, where there is spiritual decay, where there are people suffering without hope and without the good news. And what makes this a remarkable gospel is that Paul was not taught this message by any man. He was given this message by Jesus Christ himself. And so he says in Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And so what he shares with the people is a message from God. It's not his own words. It's not words that he was taught from some man or even from the church. He received this message from God and he passed it on to the people that God had told him to pass the message on to. And so we too are called to serve our master, Jesus Christ. We too are called to go into those dungeons. We are called to give hope to the hopeless, help to the helpless, to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to men, to women, to children. Second, Paul says what this gospel is that he's called to preach. Where did it come from? If it didn't come from men, if it didn't come from uh, any religious system, then where did it come from? And this message, of course, came from God himself. Even from the prophets, even from the text that we have in the Old Testament, this was a message given from God. And that's what makes this message so very powerful. Is because it's not only a fable, it is the truth. It's the truth. And it comes to us from God himself. It's a message that was promised beforehand, Paul mentions. The coming of the Messiah was predicted long, long ago. From Genesis all the way through to the end of Malachi, it's been predicting through the Holy Spirit, through the writings of the prophets, that there would be a Messiah. There would be one that would be coming from God to rescue his people from spiritual slavery, rescue his people from death. They were told where Jesus would be born. They were told how he would live. They were told what he would do. They were told that he would save his people from their sins. They were told everything they needed to know to expect Jesus' coming in the Holy Scriptures. And of course we know that all of this, all of the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ. And so this message that Paul had for the church in Rome was a message that Jesus Christ had come, was born as a human, 
and died for them, for the forgiveness of their sins. Through the blood of Jesus, there was justification. Through the blood of Jesus, there was forgiveness and reconciliation to God. And this is the message of salvation. This is the gospel that Paul's going to unravel for the rest of his book. He's going to explain exactly what it means. What the, what the prophet spoke about from the beginning. What Jesus was coming to bring to us. What kind of life he was giving to us. How he was going to bring us from a place of sl slavery to a place of freedom. How he was going to bring us from a place of sickness to a place of health. How Jesus was going to bring us into the light from the place of spiritual darkness. For what other hope is there? For a lost and dying world. What other hope is there for a man sitting in a dungeon that he was born into? That we were born into? What other hope is there for a man that's in utter darkness, unable to break the chains that hold him down? There's no hope in the guy next to him. Because he's just as chained. He's also in darkness. He's also in a place of despair. There is no hope except in this message, except in this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can break those chains. He is the only one that can bring us out of that grave into eternal life. He is the only one that can do it for us. We can't do it ourselves, and we can't do it for the guy next to us. We are all born into that same situation of spiritual death, spiritual sickness, of spiritual disease. And so the hope that Paul has to proclaim to the church in Rome is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And so this is the third point that Paul makes. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. In verse 3 we read, As to his earthly life, he was a descendant of David, but through the spirit of holiness... He was appointed the Son of God in power by His resurrection from the dead. And He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So from a purely <laughs> earthly perspective, Paul says that Jesus was a descendant of David. He was flesh, just like you and I. But He was proven to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. He was proven with power to be the Son of God. Of God. And this means that Jesus was also God. He wasn't only man. He didn't only have the nature of sinful man, but he also had the nature of the deity, of God inside of him. And so the resurrection didn't make him God, but it showed, it proved that he was God. Meaning that everything that Jesus said was true. And that's very, very important. If we are to take the scriptures as truth, we need proof that it is true. And that proof comes by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so God didn't leave us in a place of uncertainty or a place of doubt. He didn't come into our situation, say a whole bunch of stuff, and then leave. <laughs> he proved that what he said was true. He proved it by his resurrection. He proved that he was trustworthy. He proved that the gospel is saving grace for mankind. By his resurrection from the dead. And so now that he's been declared with power to be the Son of God, we can confidently believe in this gospel, believe in this message that Jesus Christ has freed us. If we would put our faith in him, if we would believe in him, if we would repent of our sins, if we would call upon his name, we will be saved. And this is our only hope. This is the only way we're free from that dungeon, is to call upon the name of the Lord. Because there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be saved than by the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet decided to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, do it today. Do it today. He offers us freedom from that dungeon of despair, of darkness, from death and the grave. He calls us out. He calls us to repentance and he calls us to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. 
And for those of you who have placed your hope and your faith in Jesus Christ, I ask you to imitate Paul in his faith. Be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to those dark places that he's called us to go to. Go to the dungeons. Go to those that are in despair. Go to those that have no way of escape. Go to those that can't help themselves. Go to the hopeless. Think about that story of the slave. We have so many places around us that are in spiritual darkness. We have so many people around us in our workplaces, people that we pass in the street, people that we pass in the mall, that are bound by chains of sin, that are bound, that can't free themselves. And they need this gospel. Brothers and sisters, they need it. And so I pray that as we go through this book of Romans, we would understand more and more and more what this salvation should mean to us. What it means to be broken free from that prison. What it means to be placed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. What it means to be taken from a place of despair and hopelessness where we're dying and sick to a place where we have eternal life. Where we have health in our spirits. Where we have communion and peace with God. Where we have forgiveness of our sins. I pray that this book of Romans will give us hope. That this book of Romans will give us the courage to go into those dark places. And to be the light. To speak the light. And to share the gospel. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this gospel which has been given to us. We thank you for the good news, that there is a way out, that there is an offer of salvation on the table. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to share that gospel freely, to share that gospel with power, to share that gospel with conviction. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be servants of you, that you would help us, O oh Lord, to be set apart as Paul was set apart for this great and important work of sharing your word with people around us. O oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to know more and more the depth of the saving grace that you've given to us, to know more and more this justification and forgiveness that you've given to us through the death of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you so much that you've proven to us that you can be trusted. Lord, we thank you so much that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we have faith. Now we can believe every single word that he said. And so, Lord, we thank you for the promise which is given to us, that you've gone to prepare a place for us. We thank you, Lord, that your promise of bringing us into light and into freedom is realized. And we thank you, Lord, for the coming salvation that will still happen on the day that you come again on the clouds and with glory. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us now to be faithful to this gospel that you've given to us. Lord, we pray that you would not leave us in our comfortable places. Lord, but that you would help us to see the darkness. Help us to see the dungeons that are around us. Help us to see the despair. And give us the courage and the boldness to proclaim your word. We pray for open doors to share this gospel with those around us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be good ambassadors of your name, good ambassadors of your kingdom, good ambassadors of this message that you've given to us. We pray, O oh God, that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to proclaim this message, to set captives free, so that your name and your kingdom can be extended. In Jesus' precious name. Thank you for watching this video. We pray that you were blessed by this online service. Please take time to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.